Nicholas Chesler here with us. Um, we were just talking before we started, although um, during this whole sort of enterprise of starting ISGAP, which is the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy, which then became the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, I lived in Jerusalem during the uh, Intifada, the second Intifada, and I was involved in peace projects between Israelis and Palestinians. And I was telling Phyllis how I met members of um, jihadist organizations and literally spent days with them speaking about philosophy and religion. And when you're up close to these issues, I think they take on a certain type of significance. And I came to the U.S. in 2001, and in 2003, the first person I ever in invited to come to give a lecture was Professor Phyllis Chesler. And um, her book, The New Antisemitism, which was written in 2003, uh, sorry, written in 2002, published in 2003, for me was the first book that really articulated or, or grappled with the issues of contemporary anti-Semitism or the new anti-Semitism, however you, you call it. And although there are parts of the books that I, I don't agree with, I think that Phyllis's work and her commitment to the issues of studying anti-Semitism and, and combating uh, the sort of so, the social movement that, which is reactionary, reactionary social movement which is using anti-Semitism to fuel support, that her work um, is very important and should be taken very seriously and engaged. And she's been at the forefront, I think, of engaging contemporary anti-Semitism, so it's especially nice to have you first, first time at Yale, second time in New Haven. Um, professor Chesler is an Amaranta Professor of Psychology and Women's Studies at City University of New York. For people who are studying you know, the feminist movement or gender studies, her book, Women, Women and Madness, from 1972, and her other writings were really at the forefront of dealing with the feminist movement, um, and her contributions are well known internationally. Uh, she is also the co-founder for the Association for Women in Psychology and the National Women's Health Network. She's the charter member of the Women's Forum. She is a founder and board member of the International Committee for Women of the Wall, and she's lectured internationally. She's written uh, more than 13 books, including The New Antisemitism, Women and Madness, Women of the Wall, Claiming Sacred Ground at Judaism's Holy Sites, and The Death of Feminism, What is Next in the Struggle for the Women's Freedom. Uh, for women's freedom. She's written hundreds of articles and lectured internationally. Today, she, she's speaking, the title of her talk is How Scapegoating Israel Diminishes the Rights of Women in the World. Welcome, and thanks Thank for being here. It's really a great pleasure to be with you. I wish that we didn't need to discuss this subject. I wish this subject, this illness, this virus, this plague had quit the earth long ago. We could talk about something else, but that is not to be. So I'm sure everybody knows that traditional anti-Semitism consists of the belief that the Jews are a people set apart who consider themselves superior, sacred, chosen, a people who seem to be everywhere. At least this is how the genocidal Haman described us in ancient Persia, in Shushan. That was literally what Haman said to Ahasuerus. This is a people, they're everywhere, they hold themselves apart, they don't follow the king's law. So I'm sure by now we know that the old kind of anti-Semitism never really left, that we control the banks, the media, the world. Uh, we, we killed the Christian God. We refuse to recognize Islam as the final perfected religion. All of this is still fueling the blood libels that continue today. So Jewish evil, Jewish power, beliefs which, as I said, it's an illness really, and there's no medicine to cure it. Reason does not do it. It's still here, but there's also something new, several things that are new. First, the extent to which the Islamic world based on Quranic sources, and then fueled by Western-style anti-Semitism, 
is now behind the demonization of Israel, together with the Western intelligentsia, media, and to a large extent, academic world also is behind it. This is a, a triumvirate, a cabal of three forces. And when I wrote in the New Anti-Semitism that also the New Anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism, my editor, who lives in Berkeley, got very nervous and said, are you sure you want to say this? Do you really mean this? And I said, sir, you know, I have been among the critics of Israel. I'm on record suing the state of Israel on behalf of Jewish women's religious rights. Yes, I wish to say this because Israel has fast become the Jew of the world. And such genocidal kinds of hatreds, such racism, leads not just to lynching, not just to pogroms, but also to Shoahs. And let's think back to the beginning of this second intifada. According to the Israeli Foreign Ministry, from 929-2000 to 11910, 1,194 Israelis were murdered by terrorists. This is before the security wall was constructed, or even a little bit thereafter. So the Israeli civilian death count is demographically equivalent to guess how many Americans? 48,700 Americans would have been killed on our own soil, in pizza parlors, in discotheques, at Passover Seder Rim, or in our beds. According to the Israeli Foreign Ministry, between 2001 and 2007, 8,342 Israelis were wounded. Their lives never the same again, the lives of those who love them never the same again. And this included nearly 6,000 civilians. Now this is the equivalent in American demographic terms of 340,000 wounded Americans. Now can you imagine what would have happened if the equivalent had happened on North American soil or in Europe? But Israel, Chaval, unfortunately, is located in the Middle East where even though it is a Western country, it's surrounded by countries where Muslim on Muslim and Muslim on infidel violence is the norm. It's like, it's what happens. It's the given. What we call the matzav, the situation, the awful situation, is life in the Middle East. It's life. Now, also, there's another feature about the new anti-Semitism, which is the doctored footage, the technology is so perfected. So Israel can be demonized in all the languages on earth 24-7 on the internet, in videos, wherever you go. And demonized and then shunned and shamed and accused of unending blood libels. So what does this really mean? I mean, it's very bad for the Jews, it's bad for Israel, it's bad for the ethics of the world. But what does it also mean? It means that Israel is being conveniently scapegoated for the crimes and sins of the Arab and Muslim world towards Arabs and Muslims. And therefore, these tragic problems are not being addressed at all because everyone is focused on blaming Israel. And you can't imagine how effective this demonization is, diverting attention from human rights violations beyond belief at home. So the, the entire worldwide media has become Palestinianized and to some extent Stalinized. So Palestinians who are only human beings, and many of them are terrorists and gangsters, and those who are not are either in jail or were murdered by them or being tortured by them or are living lives of quiet desperation at the hands of their leaders, because of their leaders, they are nevertheless all viewed as the most noble and innocent and pure of victims 
And Israel has become Goldstein in George Orwell's 1984. Israel is the, the single person to hate, to blame, and to kill, to have genocidal intent toward. Israel is the Nazi, oh, what is that? <laughs> Israel is, it's a machine run amok. Uh, <laughs> You see, they're going to take control of it. <laughs> Israel is seen as the Nazi apartheid state, right? The colonial aggressor. What a neat trick. What a neat trick. Because then we don't look at, nobody dares mention Muslim imperialism and Islamic religious and gender apartheid, which are real practices, which are then neatly projected onto Israel, where there is no similar, exact, apartheid-like practice. <coughs> of Obama's America, along with the Western intelligentsia, are wrongly blaming Israel for the failure of the peace process. And they believe it would be Islamophobic or racist to expect the Palestinians uh, um, to first accept Israel's existence as a Jewish state as a precondition for any negotiations for peace. And the American media blames Israel for not caring about peace. And human rights organizations, international organizations, medical journals like The Lancet, I'll talk about that, they only blame Israel. Now these boycotters of Israel, the divest and boycott people, they want to be seen as anti-racists. They view themselves as anti-racists, but by holding Arab and Muslim countries to much lower standards and by condemning their inhabitants to continued Islamist barbarism, they fail every ethical test of non-racism. And their anti-Zionism is, an, is the unacknowledged form of racism. The only acceptable racism is anti-Semitism. The whole world is now anti-racist, politically correct, but you can hate the Jews. That's still okay to do. That's not racism. Please understand, I have lived in the Muslim world, and I'll get to that in a moment. But this viral hatred of all things Jewish and of the Jewish Israel means that the truly tragic plight of Arabs and Muslims Certainly Muslim dissidents, ex-Muslim dissidents, apostates, gay and lesbian Muslims, women, Muslim women, infidels living in Muslim lands is being completely neglected. The Copts are being killed in Egypt. The Coptic church dare not raise its voice. Christians in Pakistan are being literally crucified. The girls are kidnapped, raped, forced to convert and marry. Muslim men, and the church does not know what to do. The other day, the most made no, it was a few weeks ago, I got this notice that the Pope is following me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, well, I thought somewhere in the bowels of the Vatican there must be somebody monitoring. The church knows it's in trouble. It can't save its own people. I thought maybe someday I'll have a meeting with the Pope and ask for the menorahs back. <laughs> maybe I'll use some influence. But now, let me take us back for a minute from the laughter to the reality of life in the Middle East, not Israel. The Arab population in the Middle East is, according to the latest census survey I could find, in 2005, about 20% were living below the $2 a day international poverty line. And as of 2005, Egypt, Egypt held at least 10,000 political prisoners. And the Palestinian territories, tiny Palestinian disputed territories, held 9,000. <coughs> and Yemen held 1,000 political prisoners. According to the 2008 World Health Organization report, women are genitally mutilated at a rate of over 90% in four Arab countries, in Somalia, in Egypt, in Djibouti, and Sudan. The genital cutting, it's not like circumcision. 
It means that girls are traumatized by real torture at the hands of adult women who they are supposed to trust and love and respect. And that as they have very, as married women and child brides, they will never know sexual pleasure. They will experience urination and menstruation as dangerous and painful. And childbirth is unbelievably traumatic. And they may develop very dangerous fistulas, which may lead to their never being allowed into company again unless a Western doctor comes to fix them, which, by the way, Western doctors try, even in Afghanistan, to do. And this is also true of the general mutilation in a number of African non-Arab countries. It's presumably an Arab custom or presumably a pagan custom, but people who perform it think that it's in accordance with Sharia law. How about the illiteracy rate that nobody's paying attention to? It's Israel's fault. 2007 United Nations report, and I don't necessarily trust their statistics, but it's what we have to use. The overall adult illiteracy rate in 18 Arab countries was 29%. But that's really loaded to the men, because the female illiteracy rates among girls and women older than 15 was 60% in Yemen, 57% in Morocco, 34% in Algeria, and uh, um, 34% in Algeria, 36% in Iraq, and that was a country with educated middle class women. 10% in the Palestinian territories. And the lowest rate of female illiteracy in the Arab world, Kuwait, Kuwait. Afghanistan, where once I lived, 87% illiteracy rate. Now, these are just tip of the iceberg numbers. If you interview Arab and Muslim women, you're going to hear things that you're not going to believe about the routine, the normalization of being beaten as a daughter, as a sister, as a wife, for the smallest thing or for no reason whatsoever. And yeah, of course there are exceptions. There are exceptions. There are refined people everywhere, but this is the rule. Um, and women cannot report such domestic violence because it would shame the family and would lead to greater violence against them. Honor killings, I cannot give you a, uh, an accurate statistic. The UN is still, from the year 2000, giving us 5,000 honor killings every year, but I think that's true just for the Punjab. And if you could really study, it's like trying to study incest. Where would you get you? You know, who's going to admit it? Who's going to come forward? Who's going to say yes? I'll be part of the study. And it's a crime that I'll talk about toward the end that is valorized. It's certainly not criminalized. And in Jordan, for example, Jordan, right? Jordan. The potential victims of honor killings who managed to escape, they're put in jail. The Jordanian government needs to jail them for their own protection. And we see reverberations of that in as each Muslim dissident or Westerner begins to speak up the truth, they need bodyguards. They need to go into hiding because that's the Middle East. Now, women are in the Middle East in Israel. And I'm not going to argue that women have full equality in Israel. I mean, it's paradise compared to Saudi Arabia, don't get me wrong. Once, once I was hanging out in the mid-1970s in Yerushalayim with a group of very tough feminist women like myself. Mm -hmm. And they were so bitter about the government. Oh, were they complaining and carrying on? I finally said, OK, I guess there's no alternative. You need to apply for political asylum in Mecca. Mm -hmm. I mean, had <laughs> no perspective at all. So I understand that there's no real full equality for women in Israel. But even, let's remember back even to the Parsha we just had by Yishlach. Shimon and Levi don't kill Dina. Dina's raped. They kill her rapists and perhaps plus more. So this honor killing is not something that Jews do. We don't do that. 
So, but there is increasing gender segregation in Israel, in the public sphere. And I'm now quoting my colleague, Anat Hoffman, who's the head of the Reform Religious uh, Action Center and who was with me when we davened for the first time in the Ezra Mashim in 1988, a struggle which still continues unbelievably. She writes that this phenomenon is escalating with numerous cases on buses, on public streets, at the, at the Western Wall, even at medical clinics, um, showing that the increasingly strict ultra-Orthodox Haredi rules do not only separate men and women, but also humiliate women and keep them in a subjugated position. But nevertheless, Israel is not an apartheid state. And I'm not going to argue that the Arab League or the PLO or Hamas or Hezbollah or Iran are directly responsible for such Haredization. That's our problem. We're doing it. But this is precisely the argument made against Israel in terms of Islamic gender apartheid. Okay, if we beat our women on the West Bank, it's because of the Israeli occupation. If we, on, if we veil our women, it's because of the Israeli occupation. It doesn't hang. They can't really say it. It's not logical. It's not true. So what is Islamic gender apartheid? It consists of all those practices which condemn girls and women to a separate and subordinate sub-existence sub and turn boys and men into the permanent guardians of their female relatives' chastity and reputation. And boys and men, by the way, are condemned to compete with siblings and half-siblings for a wealthy polygamous father's attention and inheritance. And they're condemned to live lives. They, they're not comfortable with women. They haven't grown up familiar with women. Uh, um, again, not everybody. There's exceptions. But this is the historical rule. Uh, they view women as breeders and sex objects. And any other emotion might fill uh, uh, many an Arab or Muslim man with some shame or sorrow. Male homosexuality, including male homosexual pederasty, is absolutely rampant. Fifty years ago in Kabul, Afghanistan, I would see two men walking down the street, holding hands, rouge, lipstick, a flower behind an ear with an ancient rifle. They were both sporting you know, ammunition, bandoliers, and acting, and this is pre-Stonewall uprising. And I would go back to my Afghan family and say, you can't imagine what I just saw on the street. Mm -hmm. Oh, you Americans, you're seeing things that aren't real. Mm -hmm. Today, at its most extreme, Islamic gender apartheid is characterized by very lurid headlines the acid attacks on girls in Pakistan, children for not being properly veiled enough or for daring to want to go to school. This is a sort of Taliban, the, the Pakistani Taliban. Or the public stonings to death, both in Afghanistan and in Iran, and the hangings of women and of, of women in Iran and long torture, much gang rape. The poor soul who was lashed 99 times, I believe not once, but twice, and was sentenced to be stoned to death. Perhaps some international outcry spared her for the moment, but it did not deter the execution sentence. And the authorities forced her son to watch her being lashed these 99 times. Uh, there's another woman, a human rights lawyer in Iran, who uh, actually represented Shireen Abadi. She's the last I heard, I have not kept up in the last five days, she was on a, a hunger fest with no water and was close to death and was in Evan prison. Uh, we should be crying out about such things. That means what's left of what used to be my feminist movement should be crying out in the West about such things. In fact, I think our president should be crying out about such things. Uh, and by the way, Saudi Arabia, Arab Muslim countries increasingly hardened and Islamist. Uh, if you're accused, if you try to report being raped, 
then you might find yourself killed for having committed adultery, or at the very least divorced, and you'll never see your children again. And if you try to choose your own husband, or maybe resist total veiling, you, well, you might live, but you're going to be really harassed on the streets. You're going to be on, on the streets of North Africa and in many countries in the Middle East. Cairo, I'm thinking of the, the wilding episode in Cairo. Uh, and by the way, women who were veiled and unveiled both were attacked by a thousand men. Islamic gender apartheid in an era of such jihad such an Islamist jihad era, is the most anti-woman system known to humanity. It's even worse than Israel. It's really bad. And feminists should be making a big cry. And some are, but very few, and I'm one. And I'm not a multicultural relativist. And that means I believe in universal human rights, one standard for all. So I have chosen to speak out about criminal misogyny. I mean, I certainly spoke out about Western misogyny in America, all over Europe, in the history of the world. Why would I remain silent? Why would I fall silent when suddenly the misogyny had the most vengeful face of all, and it happened to be coming to us from the Islamic world? Now, for doing this, I and others have been labeled, branded, demonized as Islamophobes and racists. And by the way, the fact that I stood up for Israel, I have been wrestling with anti-Semitism among leftists and among feminists in the academic world, in the activist world, since the day after Israel won its war of self-defense in 1967. But I didn't take that fight public. I didn't memorialize it in a book and then in a series of articles for which I then lost my entire world. And in my opinion, the gay liberationists, the feminists, the liberals, the humanists, the good people, we were the good people, they have deserted their own vision of human rights and of gender equality for refusing to take stands and for refusing to have equal standards. And they fear that if they do so, they will then be accused of being colonialists, crusaders, racists, and this concern, this fear of being accused of being racist trumps their concern, not only with the truth, which doesn't matter, but they don't care about women's rights and human rights for people who are Muslim or living in Muslim lands. This is so unfortunate. This is so crazy. And we are all endangered by this silence. I, I have now published a lot on these subjects, and I've been ostracized by many of my former colleagues of 40 to 45 years worth standing. Uh, I'm not allowed to speak at certain memorial services for the dead, women who I've loved and, and worked with. And if I go on campus, unlike here, uh, my first brush with that dragon's breath was at Barnard, and it was a freestanding conference. And when a, and it was mainly women of color who had invited me. I was very honored to be there to speak about woman's inhumanity to woman, which was the subject of my 10th book. And we were having a wonderful time together until some instigator in the audience stood up. The first question, having nothing to do with what I talked about, was, we demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I could say I light candles every night, I weep, I send money, um, I could have dodged it. But what I said instead was, I think you're asking me where do I stand on the issue of apartheid, and I oppose it and the largest practitioner of apartheid in terms of both religion and gender is Islam. Place went crazy. Crazy, went crazy. And so I had to be hustled out ultimately for my own safety. This is on an American mm -hmm. campus in New York City. That was only the first time. So since then, I'm used to having bodyguards security accompanied me to an American campus 
where I was a professor for a thousand years and a guest lecturer everywhere for 2,000 years. And now, in order for me to tell the truth, I need to have a bodyguard. Now, perspective, and it's not just me. That means to tell if, I'm not saying that I'm coming to lie about Israel, just to tell the truth. Or that I'm coming to lie about Muslims, or about Islam, or about Sharia law, or about what's happening to women in the Islamic world. I'm not coming to lie, I'm coming to tell the truth. That truth is not wanted on most American and European campuses, and less so, perhaps, on Middle East campuses. That's another discussion. So, and I'm lucky. I'm not in jail, I'm not being tortured, I'm not being beheaded, I don't have to write under a pseudonym, I don't need bodyguards 24-7, death threats are very minimal. Uh, I mean, it's, all right, so I can't get published as I once did. All right, so I have to do some is done on the internet. That means when, when there was censorship in Soviet Russia, you published, you self-published, and one intellectual, one supporter would pass your work around. And that's how I view the internet, by the way. Because most publishers, most mainstream publishers, and I've been a very successful author, are afraid to touch the subject. This book was the very first book, 2005, that wrote about, in which I wrote about, the penetration of the West by, Islam, by Islamic gender apartheid, by the Anna killings in the West and in immigrant communities. And it's mainly Muslim on Muslim, although Sikhs and, and, Sikhs and Hindus do do this. They, Indians do it in India. They, they don't come to the West to do this. My colleagues, that's what matters the most when we were talking about it. I, basically, I miss a world that no longer exists. I miss people who have turned out not to be who I thought we all were, certainly supposed to be. And they are now more concerned with a country called Palestine, which has never existed, than they're concerned with the fate of the women living in the Palestinian territories. It's really very horrifying. And my first serious confirmation was when I delivered a, a preliminary speech on the honor killing, second study, in Rome at a G8 conference, and a bunch of Muslim feminists surrounded me, some in hijab, some not. And they said, where have you been? We've been abandoned by the Western feminists. And I said, he made it. I am here, here I am. Because indeed, they have been. And I am told that the recent Women's Studies annual meeting in Colorado, which I, I stopped going long ago, uh, was that they were making very light of all these things that are happening to women in Muslim countries. And then they started attacking me. I saw it. the man who was there said, I had to leave, I was ready to throw up. I said, no, no, they do me honor. Maybe I learned my radical feminism in Kabul long ago because I married a childhood sweetheart from college, from Bard College and he was very Western and very sophisticated and I thought he would be another king of Allah, so to speak, who tried very hard to uh, free the women and the people of the country and lived out the rest of his life, luckily alive in exile in Italy. And when the plane landed, they took my passport away and I was put into Perda, really, with the other girls. And it was a polygamous household. I said, your father has three wives. I said, you never mentioned this? He said, oh, I didn't think it was important. He said, the second one doesn't really count. I said, I just visited her. She's a nice woman. What do you mean, doesn't count? Die. He did it because he had to. So I learned at 20, turning 21, that um, women who are really hard pressed and oppressed they mistreat other women real big time. <laughs> and they're female servants who are like slaves. Uh, the daughter-in-law is right up there, commonplace. Uh, it helped me, by the way, see sexism in America with a clarity and sexism internationally with a clarity thereafter. And all uh, ex 
good educations are very expensive. So now my former colleagues, our former colleagues, and when I came back at the time, I couldn't get anybody to listen to what I was trying to say. It was like the man who would be king. I have to tell you what happened. Were you really a princess? I have to tell you what happened. What did the women really wear? I finally stopped trying to tell, at least in the short run, and I got involved in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, then the feminist movement. Where I still am, alone in a way, and over the years, by the way, many, many Jewish feminists would call me up on the phone and say, on the phone, whispering, you're so brave. Wish we could be this brave. So, but they're afraid because indeed, when you take a stand for the truth, and when that truth concerns the Jews or it concerns Israel, or it concerns Islam or jihad, then you are risking your reputation, you are risking your job, you are risking, you are risking your credibility. It is mind-boggling. So they're afraid, they're afraid. Um, and I have many examples here. We may not have enough time. Crazy, crazy examples. There's a psychiatrist from Israel named Dr. Ruhama Martin. I don't know her. At a conference for War and Peace in 2002 at the University of New Paltz, what does she say? She says that she likens Israelis to batteries in a marriage. And guess who's the battered wife? No, nope, the Palestinians. I, I ask, well, what are the, the Israelis and Palestinians are married? And is the feminist view of marriage that it's like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? <laughs> well, maybe it is. Huh? And, and why was only Israel-Palestine discussed at a conference on war and peace? The world is a wide place. Earlier this year, January, the Lancet, this prestigious, presumably prestigious, medical journal from England, led by a Harvard researcher, blamed Israel for an increase in Palestinian wife battering in Gaza and on the West Bank. Did anybody read this article? Yeah. No, I did. Now, the researchers didn't even consider the role that radical Islamification might play in the oppression of women, or the fact that Gaza is now ruled by Islamist terrorists and gangsters, and that this might cause an escalation of violence towards women. This was, and there had been a study just done of honor killings in Gaza and the West Bank by a Swiss <coughs> researcher, Hansen, and they didn't include honor killing. They didn't include daughter killing. They just looked at wife killing, uh, uh, wife beating, sorry. And I published a letter together with a number of other people in their pages. Now, does anybody know who Dr. Leela Abu Lugad is? Oh, she's a very important at Columbia, and she walks in Edward Said's steps, and her father was for 35 years a professor mainly at Northwestern, but he, like Edward Said, you see, comes from Palestine, which was taken from them in the great Nakba. And her mother is Jewish, but she was raised Muslim, and she gave a speech in October on the 25th day in Beirut at the American University in which she said that there are those who are seeking to sensationalize honor killings. They should be warned away from doing that because, um, wait, I have to give you exactly. The obsessive focus, yes, it represents simplistic civilizationist, that's a new one, thinking. And it may have negative repercussions, and that people should be wary of classifying certain acts as distinctive form of violence against women. Uh, see, uh, all cultures are the same. There's domestic violence everywhere. Our <coughs> killing is the same as Western domestic violence. We dare not point a finger. Well, yeah, we do dare point a finger, because it's not the same. It's different. Heinous, but different. And she. Her feminist work, and she is a gender studies professor, an anthropologist, is only in the service of one nationalism only. She's not universalist, and that's Palestinian, and of one tradition only, Islam. 
Islam, in Islamism. And she finds the veil something that, as a feminist, we <coughs> should understand. She says, specifically, why are we surprised that Afghan women do not throw off their burqas when we know perfectly well that it would not be appropriate to wear shorts to the opera? <laughs> well, you know, if I don't wear shorts to the opera, they're not going to kill me. And they won't kill me if I do wear them either. I don't think that there's a comparison here. So she also finds something to say positively about polygamy. And there are exceptions, but mainly, no, it's not a good thing. It's not good for the women. <laughs> it's not good for the children. It's not good for the sons, especially, who compete for the inheritance and for the attention. Bin Laden's father had 57 children. Bin Laden is trying to get his father's attention. I would say this as a former psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapist, but what do I know? So I don't think it's such a good idea to have polygamy with so many children. And basically she criticizes, and she's joined by, West, she is a Western feminist herself, she criticizes colonial feminism. Why? because I think it's a way of reminding Western thinkers, heirs to the colonial adventure, that given their ancestors' past crimes, we dare not feel superior to the Islamic world. And above all, we should never dare to intervene to free Muslim prisoners from Muslim tyrants, jailers, and murderers. Because she's really saying that by writing anything that stigmatizes or exposes, even if true, a feature of the Islamic world that you're stigmatizing them and you're, you're going to be killed because you're exposing them to shame. That's what an honor killing is partly about. Um, I've published two studies on honor killings. The findings are interesting. They're important. Uh, there's not just one target group. One is a, an average age of 17 a girl who's killed by her family of origin her father, her brother, her uncle, her mother. And it's planned either because there's some alleged, there's an allegation of some impropriety she was seen, we heard, talking to a boy, or because she actually, in Europe, for example, wants to go to college, wants to have a profession, may even want to have friends who are not Muslims, may want to have a husband of her own choosing or a husband who's not Muslim and worse, a god who might not be Muslim, so the apostates, that's an automatic death sentence. So for refusing to veil or veil enough or, for, or refusing to marry your first cousin, some illiterate fellow from a, a distant country who needs the equivalent of a green card or citizenship in the West, she might die, and there's a high level. These honor killings are torture murders, and they're at their most savage, not in the Muslim world, but in Europe, because the temptation to assimilate is so high there, and the girls and women are <coughs> opting for Western lives, and they're dying for it. They're setting examples. This is what will happen to you if you do that. So I'm going to skip. You can, the, the studies are on my website and they're also published at Middle East Quarterly's website. So let me say that I still do feminist work in my opinion, only now my allies have slightly changed. My allies are Muslim dissidents and Muslim feminists and ex-Muslim dissidents and feminists. And we all share a desire to have universal human rights a separation of mosque, synagogue, church, and state, individual rights, rights for, think of all the groups, the pariah groups, the gypsies, the homosexuals, rights, free press, a free press. If you ever heard Abu uh, Khaled Tomei talk about the importance to him of, dis of, of experiencing a free press in Israel, although I would say, I don't know, it's very leftist. But we can joke about that. So now my feminist vision has borne unexpected and very important fruit because it's allowing a new kind of bridge, a new kind of alliance to form on behalf of Western civilization, on behalf of Western values, and also on behalf of Israel. 
Islamic gender apartheid is a human rights violation and it can't be justified in the name of cultural relativism, tolerance, anti-racism, diversity, or political correctness. The battle for women's rights is central to the battle for Europe and for Western values. It's a necessary part of democracy along with freedom of religion, tolerance, and freedom of dissent. Here, exactly, is where the greatest battle of the 21st century is joined. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So okay. we have time for a Q and A, and I'll take the prerogative of asking the first question. Oh, uh, I thought I was going to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and, and it's interesting. So it's it's questions, sort of two questions. I, I just came back from Ottawa. Uh, there was a interparliamentary conference in the Canadian Parliament of 49 countries attended, including Muslim countries, um, 100 scholars from around the world. And I was, I'm originally from Montreal, and I was very proud to be Canadian. Canadians are not so nationalistic, but I, I was very proud. And why? Because I think Canadians really understand what's at stake, and I think they get a lot of what you've been speaking about, the Prime Minister, the opposition uh, leader, as well as uh, intellectuals really get um, what's at stake. And I think Canadians understand perhaps more than Americans do today, I would argue, because Canadian multiculturalism isn't relativism. Okay. And multiculturalism, which I think in a large sense began in Canada, people like Charles Taylor and Will Kimlicka spoke about how um, multiculturalism was about integrating the other economically, socially, and culturally. Um, and it was sort of there was a tension, and you have to create a balance between integrating the other and, and integrating another into a social democracy. So some of the practices of the other were welcome in the public sphere, some are appropriate in the private sphere, and some are illegal, such as honor killing and other things. So there isn't this sort of relativism, and Canadian multiculturalism is very much a part of the identity and policies of the country. And I think that type of multiculturalism helps to equip Canadians to understand that reactionary Islamism uh, is is a threat to social democracy and a threat to I would say to to uh, democracy everywhere and human rights everywhere. So I, I was very happy to be there for a few weeks, and it was a bit of a reprieve, I have to say, given the the um, condition I find in the United States these days. I'm reminded of Judith Butler, oh. a Yale graduate, a leading oh. scholar, a very respected scholar internationally. She's speaks of her Jewish and gay background uh, proudly. And she recently said that Hamas and Hezbollah should be seen as, as part of the progressive left. Yeah. And, and, That's and, why I saw it. Yeah. No, but, but I think she just said this recently in Berlin, and she was very well received in Europe. And there's sort of this, I, I agree with you, that you, know, you were part of the feminist movement, I was part of the anti-apartheid movement, very active in the anti-apartheid movement, and my comrades uh, former comrades, or many of them were intellectuals and scholars, also, I think, take this line that you've been saying, sort of, you know, apologists for radicalism. So my question is, why in the United States is there, among intellectuals, I'd say this, among many intellectuals, this sort of, uh, I would say, either acquiescence to radical Islam or this, you know, acceptance of this contemporary anti-Semitism and some of the issues in terms of gender that you spoke to. So okay. there's this blind spot. But my other question is... Wait, wait, let me answer that. Yeah, okay. That's a hard, that's a good one. But it, it's it connected. connected. Okay, well, I'm going to connect it. But on the other hand, I have to say, I would be critical of your use of Islam. Because I think Islam, is, you know, there's more than one and a half billion Muslims in the world. It's a rich uh, religion, culture, civilization. There's different traditions, different practices different philosophical outlooks and schools of thought. So, are you speaking about Islam, or are you speaking about Islam? I'm going to answer right? everything. Okay, and if you are speaking about Islam, that's very different than reactionary. Well, no, no, see, the, okay. see, the thing is, that, let me deal with the second one first. I have loved Muslims. I have longed for the Islamic world. It's, I'm akin to it at some level that I do not understand. Nevertheless, historically, 
it has been a world not just of hospitality and great charm, but of barbarism and of a different set of values. And we have evolved in the West because we criticize religion. We've had diversification in Christianity and also in Judaism. Um, Islam has yet to do that, has yet to begin to speak in a thousand voices. And it must do that for the next step. The, the imposition by Muslim dissidents of Western values that evolved post Spinoza. Um, there was just a Casablanca declaration, uh, which said all the right things, it said all the things that we said at an earlier conference on Islamic uh, dissidents in St. Petersburg, Florida in, I believe, 2005. It, but it's very good that now they've <coughs> done it in their own voices with their own names, but I think it has to come from within. I think there needs to be a wrestling among Muslims with their Koran and with Sharia law and with how it's applied. They need to separate, as Jews have learned to do, have had to do, what is merely menachah, what is custom, from what is halakha, from what is law. And if the law, if the law needs to evolve with contemporary concepts of humanity and of fairness, kindness, equality, etc. That has not happened. Now, could it happen? Perhaps. Is it likely to happen in an era of rising jihad, of such madness, such hardening of the Islamic artery? I don't know. It makes it harder, not easier. But, um, we were having a conversation on the way up here. Um, Germans are not all evil. Germans under Hitler were not all evil. Some were very good. Some even tried to save some Jews. Uh, some died for trying. Um, some disobeyed orders at some levels, but most kept quiet. They didn't want to stick their necks out. They didn't want to get in trouble. They didn't want to die. They didn't want to be heroes. They wanted to just lead lives and or good lives. That's the problem with the 1.2 billion who are in the grip of Islamist fanatics. I didn't say Muslim fanatics. I said Islamist fanatics. Now, in Tehran, my god. What an opportunity, what an uprising, what incredible heroism. I've been in touch with Iranian feminists who I'm in awe of. Once I, I got a phone call, uh, they, they, it was an International Women's Day march a few years ago, and they said they have threatened to shoot us down like dogs in the street if we march. Do you think we should march? I said, if I would stay home, I said. I said, <laughs> but, I said but you know, I'm here. It's easy, it's your decision. They marched. And then they told me it wasn't so bad. They only arrested 113, and we found where 110 are being kept so far. So I do think that there is extraordinary ferment in the Muslim and Arab world to have human rights, to have democracy, uh, and, to, to, and to indeed separate mosque and state. But will they succeed? If our president of the free world, Obama, took a longer time by five days than, than the French <coughs> Prime Minister Sarkozy to say, we're with you in the streets, we recognize what you're suffering, in Tehran as you're being murdered and parted off to prison because you're protesting an illegal, corrupt election, then who is standing with the Muslims who are willing to defy the mullahs? who are willing to defy the false mullahs, who is standing with them? So that's part of an answer to the second part, the, first, the second part of your question. The first part is more complicated. Partly, it's the Stalinization process of the Western Academy, the American Academy. Everything about America is bad, capitalism is bad, um, but you know, now that apartheid has been more or less ended in South Africa, all those forces that needed to act out, not wrongly, by the way, needed to have a new target 
They needed to have all that energy to stand up to protest, and they chose Little Israel. They chose Little Israel. They didn't choose Saudi Arabia, <laughs> where women can't go out unless they're covered from head to foot. I didn't want to get into Saudi Arabia for the moment. So partly it's, it's the liberal left who have now perched in the academy in America. And they're still fighting against the anti-Vietnam War. Trust me. This is their youth. They can't get past it. They can't let it go. It's a different war. It's post 9-11. They don't get it. They are, and at a deeper level, they would like even the barbarians to take Wall Street down, as they all these years have said they are going to do. But they have, you know, very nice tenured lives, and they're not doing it, but they're very happy to be part of, it's sort of slumming, it's sort of erotic <laughs> slumming in a way, um, it's waltzing with Che, it's uh, getting off on the bottom Meinhof group, the jihadist, the mujahideen, a feminist, Jan Goodwin, who I once knew, she went and she hung out with the Mujahideen. She loved them. They loved her. She had red hair. She was the only woman. Where could she go wrong? They were wonderful. They, of course, became the Taliban for a number of complex reasons. So uh, there's a fascination with death that's also an element here, a flirtation with death, living dangerously on the dark, wild side, and identifying with some criminal sort of impulse, it's eros versus thanatos, it's life versus death force. But I think it's also that the people who are identifying with totalitarian jihadists are more afraid of them than we are. Mm -hmm. they, are more, they think that if they appease, surrender, give in, act nice, shah still, peace, we want peace, only give them whatever they want, that they'll go away. If Israel surrenders more and more and more and more and more, that then it will stop and Israel will be loved and safe. No, this is not the case. So the, I think that some of my former comrades, colleagues, who, and by the way, I think you're right, multi-diversity I'm in favor of, and, and America has been somewhat brilliant at integrating successive waves of immigrants so that everyone still has their own ethnicity, religious customs, religious practices, and yet are Americans. <laughs> We've accomplished that miracle. I think Canada is accomplishing that miracle, maybe in a, in a slightly different way. It's the relativism. In, in fact, once I gave a, a lecture, it was very embattled, it's, it was at City University, the Graduate Center, and WBAI, where I appeared on the very first feminist radio program ever, called Electra Rewired in 1970 or 71. They sent a little crew, and they heard when I said I oppose multicultural relativism because it is racist. They heard me opposing multicultural diversity, mm -hmm. and then went and did a program saying she's a racist, she's a racist. And I, I didn't weep, but I felt so sad for the ignorance, you know, for the. Sometimes ignorance is a bigger enemy, or as big an enemy as evil. It's very big. So I think there are psychological factors, but, but I also think that the, the Socialist Workers' Party, the Social Democrats, all those who really were communists in America, who became um, the academics of America, who ruled the roost, they're doing the hiring. They're doing the firing. And you have to conform to a certain way of thinking. It's very tragic. It's, so this is, I gave you a very quick answer to a very important and complicated question. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm curious to uh, understand, do you feel the, um, this kind of abandonment of human rights and a, a women rights and freedom of press and all of the all of those movements that you describe as truly that Israel became like the fin final pathways. Whatever kind of failure occurs, the final pathway is the expression by criticizing Israel or it's nascently 
really related to true anti-Semitism? And if so, what is the construct? Is it based on hatred? Is it based on identification with the perpetrator? Really expressing, a la Judith Butler, you reminded me of what I wanted to say, are they expressing their own uh, sense of failure, their own frustration, their own inability to really turn uh, lesbian separatism into a, a mainstream phenomenon or women's rights? We don't have an equal rights amendment in America, uh, etc. Whether that uh, uh, failure is now fueling this demonization of Israel, a, a, a failure that's unacknowledged, or whether it is also merely the anti-Semitism of old in a new form that is piling on Israel. And I think it's both. I do. Uh, when I'm thinking of Alice Miller, my old, a Alice Walker, my, my old friend has been signing on all these petitions for the flotilla for Gaza. Mm. And you can't imagine the, no, the feminist names that are attaching themselves to this toxic garbage. I don't, un I mean, at some level, I don't understand. Uh, because in Alice's case, she's successful. Uh, she may have a, a private sorrows, that may explain a little bit, but she's become a Buddhist. I don't get it. With Judith Butler, who I don't know, I don't know the woman, thank goodness, uh, but, I'll, but I know something more important. Um, there was an attack on American feminists in a British journal by, I forget her name, Sunaritha Bonnie is this person's name. And some British people begged me to take it on. And I took a look. I said, all right, I see that the only feminists that, that she named were me, Judith Butler, and Zilla Eisenstein. I said, bingo, she's naming the Jews, the Jewish American feminists. So I asked both of them if they would want to join me in writing a rebuttal to this piece of propaganda garbage that was written. And they both opted out, because they're not going to stick their head up high, because they would lose their following, they would lose their publishers, they would lose their reputations for being the kind of cool Jews, which means, what's a cool Jew? A cool <coughs> Jew is somebody who is the first to turn on other Jews, is the first to criticize the state of Israel, and trust me, I've done that in spades. Um, but I didn't do it to be a cool Jew, and now I won't do it. So um, they're cool Jews, and they, their cachet, their, their ability to, to be powerful in the world, <coughs> i.e. to be allowed to live, to be suffered to live, is to continue to be the first out to criticize, and never, never to defend, never to say, listen, the matter is complicated, there's really more than one story, there are competing narratives, no. So, it's partly once they're in bed with power and opportunity, they cannot give it up. Not even for the truth, not even for the survival of not just their people, the Jews, but for the survival of the very way of life in America or in the West that allows them to be who they are. So there's some level, it's, I don't think it's self-hatred, by the way. That's been a, an idea that's floated around. I, I think it's opportunism. I think it's a clear understanding that this is how you succeed, and you don't succeed the other way. The other way, you fail. And um, I, I think also that people desperately, limousine liberals is the phrase, they need to symbolically rail against something without taking any risky action themselves, without enduring any consequence whatsoever to themselves, and Israel. It just fits the bill. It doesn't matter how many people are being tortured in Egypt for trying to say no free press. Or I interviewed an Egyptian man a couple of years ago. Very wealthy, very powerful, but, but a, a human rights activist. And I promised him I'd let him see what I was going to publish before I did. And I did. He said, oh my God, he said, you, they'll kill me if you say I said this and this and this. And he, he's somebody who visits Israel. 
So the, 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 the secret lives of what Arabs and Muslims can say in their own language <coughs> and what they can say in English is two different worlds, two different lives. And the West had better really get that very quickly, and they still have not. There may even be more pathways. Nobody wanted to stop the fight against apartheid. Like, being a good person means you're standing up against the evil. And the real evil is so big, so wide, so deep, so evenly spread everywhere, that it's easier for most people to just have one little target, one little symbol. What, that's the identification with the aggressor? No, 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 it's, it's just easier. If people stood up against evil everywhere, where would their, they would have no lives left. It would be evil in each country on earth. It would be evil even in their own hometowns. Maybe under their own roofs, in their own families. So take care of it by identifying evil in just one tidy little place. The identifying with the aggressor may also be part of it psychologically, but that's the fear. The fear that the terror, and the, and the delusion that if I say all the right things, if I'm the right kind of Berlin Jew, 1938, they're not going to, all right, Auschwitz, they're going to send me to the good line. If I'm politically correct, they're going to send me to the good line. So I think it's fear. And to some extent, the fear is then soothed, calmed by the identification with aggressive behavior. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, two quick questions, you can just answer one or the other or both. Um, in what way is um, identifying mm, um, gender inequality in, in the Islamic world as a reason to um, not target Israel, different from identifying Israel's failings to not deal with problems in the Islamic world by the Islamic country? So, say, so say, um, what's the question? The question is, the Islamic world often uses Israel as a scapegoat. In what way are we not using the Islamic world as a scapegoat to not see the problems of Israel? Oh, oh, please. Not, I, 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 Ooh, I don't mean it in Speak for yourself. No, I, um, I have seen the problems in Israel, and I have taken stands on those problems, and some I fear I can no longer try to solve, given my years and where I'm living. But as what you're asking is, don't we run the risk if we now begin for the first time to focus on the, the, the corruption and the tyranny and the misogyny in the Islamic world, if we even begin for the first minute to focus on it, because nobody's focusing on it, isn't that then going to lead us to abdicate our responsibility, like Rabbi Hillel asks you, to, to then look within at our own house and clean it? Um, yes? On some level, I think what I'm really saying is there's clearly a really big problem in the Islamic world, and we should be doing everything we can to, to solve it. But um, let's say in the context of an anti-Semitism talk, um, using it as a mechanism to then say that criticism of Israel is unwarranted. Oh, oh no, no, no. So see, clearly that's not what you're trying to do. No, no, no. But the demonization of Israel is not the same as criticism. Demonization is then shunning, shaming, boycotting, exaggerating, accusing Israel of committing a massacre in Janine, which it never did, accusing Israel of the crime, of daring to defend itself when it's under attack, which it has tried to do, accusing Israel falsely of purposely murdering this little boy, Mohammed al dura when at the end of the day, it turns out, heck, kid may not have been murdered at all, and certainly not by Israelis, and definitely not on purpose or accusing Israel of that mowing down Rachel Corey on purpose. No. See, these are lies. And th this, this is what passes for the criticism. The true criticism sounds very different. The demonization sounds more as what I've just said. The true criticism, I only, in a small way, since it wasn't the subject of the lecture, alluded to by I see the, an increasing Haredization of life in Israel, and I'm a religious Jew, so I'm a Torah study junkie. I, you know, I, I, understand, I like it, but on the other hand, the mistreatment of non-Orthodox Jews and the uh, mistreatment of Jews who are not religious at all 
and the mistreatment of women in any of the above categories is like beyond contempt. And I'm on record suing the state of Israel over this very, very issue. And I've been involved in the feminist movement in Israel since 1974 or 5, in many different ways. I, it doesn't matter, but I have been. And what happened with the Intifada of 2000 forced me to, to shift my focus. When I saw the uh, lynching of the two Israeli reservists mm -hmm. in Ramallah mm -hmm. being played over and over again with the blood-stained hands at the window, with the crazy grin, with the mobs cheering, by Western media heads with no emotion. They played it again and again and again with no affect. Nobody said, ah, nobody blanched or drew back in horror or uh, said, this is a lynching, this is a lynching, this is terrible. Everybody had no emotion. And then I knew, that's the only time I wept briefly, because then I knew that the bloody beast is back. 9-11, then 9-11, I said, not only is the bloody beast back in, in big time vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but that same rough beach, beast slouching towards Bethlehem, so to speak, uh, is coming to get us. That the life I escaped in Kabul, Afghanistan, could happen to people in New York City or in New Haven, Connecticut. And it seemed to me then that the priority wasn't the critique of Israel, although there's plenty to criticize. You know, the human beings, you know, Jewish human beings. Don't even ask. I, I, hours, I can keep you busy for hours. But in the scheme of things, the world is not threatened by Israel's imperfections, mm -hmm. by Israel's failure or Israel's, uh, uh, it's not, the world is not threatened by it. The world is threatened by jihad and by Islamism and by Islamic gender and religious apartheid. So how can you focus on criticizing Israel? I don't get it. And that's what you have all, so many young, well-intentioned Jewish students who are doing just that. Can I, do you understand that? Um, understand the attacking Israel and not the Islamic world? Yes. The, well, the yes. Islamic world that perpetrates such crimes? No, personally, the summer I just read a book called Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof, which talks yes. about a lot of the issues yes. that you talked about. But I still would say that an issue like the settlements is something that I care about stopping. Um, and that sir, Islamic sir. issues are separate mm -hmm. from that. Sir, sir. You, you know, we have one life and 24 hours each day. And the settlement issue, while important, and while we can all agree to disagree or to have who knows what point of view, it's not a threat in the same way. You can't compete. It's not morally equivalent. It's not, not the same. So any, no, so a young student, Jewish or not Jewish, who focuses on the settlement is not so different from the Obama administration, which has lately been focusing on the settlement, as if the settlement is really the problem, is the issue, as opposed to the Palestinian rejectionism, the Arab League and the Muslim rejectionism of a Jewish presence in the Middle East, which is the issue, and not the settlements. The settlement, the real settlement, is Tel Aviv. That's the settlement. Mm -hmm. So the settlement, Israel has been, look, I'm not a military expert, Israel, to the best of my knowledge, has wanted peace truly and has made so many offers and could long ago. The, the early Chalutzim and Chalutzat, the pioneers who went to Israel, expected to somehow live trading, dealing with the Arabs who were there. It's the Arabs who ultimately, the Arab leadership, to the detriment of the Palestinian people, who never existed. They were Syrians, they were Jordanians, they were Egyptians. There was no such thing as a Palestinian people. Uh, who made it impossible, who decided to use the Palestinians as the wedge issue, the festering wedge issue forevermore against the Jewish Zionist entity. That's the problem. That's the problem. And not the settlements. Uh, we could criticize Israel as you have about the treatment of uh, Israel Arabs, for example. 
But I don't want to get into that. I'd like to ask a broader question, which is you are concerned about the jihad. And I am too. And you are, if you're willing to admit there are many, many Islamic voices, Arab Islamic voices, non-Arab, uh, people out of the Middle East, quite different voices. And the issue is, how does one appeal to those who are not committed to jihad? And one has to, I think, look at the other side of it and how, I know the settlements don't, don't I agree, uh, affect world peace. But if you're, if you're a, a, let's call him moderate, who doesn't know which way to go, what does he see? He sees U.S., Iraq, U.S., Afghanistan, uh, uh, Iran. In other words, to them, it looks like another kind of a crusade from their point of view. So I mean, the jihad on one side, the crusade on the other side. So in fairness, I think one has to look at what is being played in terms of the, 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 the average uh, Muslim mind. So there is a, another story here. And I wonder if you appreciate that side. Oh, totally. I, 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 I <coughs> I'm sorry, I'll uh, repeat the question. I will repeat the question. On the one hand, there, there's the perception in a very not free press, controlled press, Muslim world, the perception is, because there's been brainwashing, that Americans are now embarked. At, let's go back to the Crusades themselves. They were undertaken only after many centuries because of Islamic imperialism and ethnic cleansing of Christians. So there's a different way to understand the Crusades to begin with. But all right, as an aside, I'm talking about this crusade. No, no, I know. So the Crusade, but the word Crusade still goes back to the old one, which is not well understood. So the perception, you're right that America is now embarked on some imperial enterprise, some CIA diabolical conspiracy to subjugate the Muslims in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq now, or to end Islam in those countries, and certainly it's to bring great saying. devastation. I'm not saying we have our own objectives in those countries. But from their point of view, how no, do no, they I, see I, it? No, I'm arguing it from their point of view. Their point of view that we've, we've gone in there. Maybe after oil, nothing else. Oil, gas, precious minerals in Afghanistan. Uh, that if, if, if the West wanted it, we should just go in right away to Saudi Arabia. You know, why would we be wasting our time in Afghanistan? It would be crazy. But bin Laden was given refuge there, and bin Laden was the mastermind of a movement that then attacked us, not just on 9-11, but on a number of previous uh, uh, occasions. Attacked military barracks, attacked the USS Cole, etc. So, um, although I don't know if Al Qaeda did the USS Cole, I'm, I'm not sure. So, the perception that has been allowed to fester and that's really felt among uneducated Muslims, against Ill, among illiterate Muslims, and also among very, very educated Muslims is that it's all the fault of the big Satan and the little Satan. Whatever the problem is, it's Israel's fault and it's America's fault. And the proof, the proof is look at it, look at the adventure in Afghanistan, look at the adventure in, in Iraq. How do we reach people who have not committed themselves to jihad is your question, is the heart of your question. I think one among many ways is to have when I gave a speech for a group of Iranians in D.C., it was beamed up live via satellite and translated simultaneously into Farsi, into Persian, and into Kurdish, possibly into Arabic. I'm not, I don't think so, maybe. Then I did a few programs on al Hura, which is an American-backed program, uh, into the Arab Middle East. I think we need to have an exchange of ideas with the people on the ground. We have the media to do it. We need to have some funding for translations from various Western languages uh, into various the languages of the Muslim world so that we give the people in their hands directly a choice. Either they're going to only trust what the mullah says in the mosque or what their father tells them, or they have other voices 
that they can uh, consult with and draw their own conclusions from. Uh, let me recommend, there's a very important book edited by Zaino Barron called The Other Muslims, Moderate and Secular. Zaino is a friend, she's Turkish, Greek, American, and it's a heartbreaking book. First, I tried to review the, it, it, it's essays by anti-Islamist <coughs> Muslim dissidents and feminists who are all in a different way saying why are Western governments only hiring the Islamists who say that they're moderates and not listening to us. Why doesn't anybody listen to us? So I wrote first to the London Review of Books, could I review this? No, they said. Then I wrote to the New York Times, can I review this book? No, they said. I may have asked the Washington Post, they said no. I said, let somebody else review it. Don't let me review it, but please review it. It has not been reviewed. So the, there are, now these are Muslims who are living in exile from their home countries. There are many Muslims living, I mean, in, so, there are feminists in Saudi Arabia who I've met with. They're wonderful, they're wondrous. They're at risk, they're very brave. Uh, I would like to know what they're saying in Arabic. I don't. It's not being translated into English. So I think there's a vast, both there's a communication and technology problem that can be solved because we have ideas that are very fertile, but are not being exchanged. So that's one, one answer. Um, the question on the uh, international human rights for women. And basically, what I'm asking is for you to clarify for me, if you would, the question of costume for women in a particular ethnic group uh, versus uh, human rights. I mean, we know, we know within the Jewish religion, the question of covering the body you know, varies uh, from the reform to the uh, orthodox. Uh, and so I suppose that exists in, in quite a few different cultures. Where do you, where do you analyze that? Where would you say it you know, becomes a human rights issue rather than just, this is the culture? Okay. First, I have an article in Middle East Quarterly. Now the question yeah. is having to do with religious clothing. And where do I stand on this issue? Or clothing in the name of God. I've been writing about this for some time. My latest article is in Middle East Quarterly. It's called Ban the Burqa? Question mark, the Argument in Favor. Now, I'm not talking about hijab. I'm not talking about headscarf. I'm not talking about covering the hair. I'm not talking about religious insignia. I am talking about the burqa, the chador, the chadari. I am talking about what amounts to a sensory deprivation isolation chamber that makes communication very difficult, identification impossible, certainly in, a, in an age where security and terrorism is an important factor. Uh, but I, beyond the, the, the security reasons, I think the other reason is a woman's rights, human rights reason, because it then, first, if you never see the sunlight, uh, you're going to develop vitamin D deficiency and all the diseases that accrue thereof. And if you can't see and you have no peripheral vision and you might fall and break bones and you might be afraid to go out and you might begin to feel claustrophobic, anxious, and persecuted, which happens when you wear the full head from top of head down to ankle covering. And the interesting thing, the approach I took in this article, is there are many Muslim and Arab countries that have been restricting and banning the Islamic veil for quite a long time, and also recently, and saying that it's not a religious requirement, that this is a flag of jihad. This is a flag of male supremacy. This has nothing to do with Islam. Who said that? The head of Al-Azhar University in Cairo was passing a high school or a college, I have the detail here, and he saw uh, a girl with a niqab, face veil. 
And he said, please take that off. There's no religious commandment. Now, of course, they can change the interpretation if they will. But what the Quran says, I'm told by Quranic scholars, is that both men and women should dress modestly. And that further, the, the wives of Muhammad uh, wore veils, perhaps to signify their importance or their being set apart. So why would we in the West wish to honor as a religious commitment or commandment something that is probably not mandated by the Quran that has been outlawed for more than 20 to 80 to 100 years in any number of Muslim countries that is now being restricted and outlawed in those countries for uh, security reasons so that the battle is on on this issue and I cannot believe that President Obama in his opening speech in, Chi in Cairo said, you know, he is very honored that America has stood up uh, for a woman's right to veil. Now what he was talking about was before his time, the Justice Department weighed in on an Oklahoma case of a sixth grade girl who demanded the right to wear hijab and the school board just said, no, you can't. And the ACLU, of course, always causing legal unrest, they took the case and uh, <laughs> they took the case and when it looked likely that the Justice Department was going to weigh in, the school board gave in instead. Now, again, I'm saying, let's even take an extreme example of nuns, who, many of whom no longer wear the full habit. A nun is not part of a jihadic movement seeking through military force to subdue, humiliate, and terrify all populations on earth. No, that's not what a nun represents. And most nuns these days are dressed casually in modern fashion. So when you find young women who are American born or not at Ivy League universities, where you will find them, wearing niqab in class, wearing a full chador in class with gloves and sunglasses, we're looking at something else. We're looking at a statement which they may feel is a, a form of resistance to racism, resistance to against Islamophobia, which doesn't exist, but which is considered right up there with anti-Semitism, in fact, far more important than anti-Semitism. It's another fake emperor. So I'm not in favor of the burqa. I think we should ban it. And yes, I have all kinds of questions. Should the French model be our model? Because they did not mention the word Islam in the law that they've passed now. That could be overturned by the European Parliament. Um, they just said face covering. That means anybody, a criminal, <laughs> a terrorist, um, somebody who's really cold and, and snowing on your face and you want to cover it with a ski mask, the face can't be covered. It was a religion neutral, carefully worded religion neutral law. Do we follow that path? Will constitutional lawyers in America find grounds to do so or not? It, would we have to prove that it's not really a religious requirement, but is a political statement about a system that is not merely a religion, but is military, social, political, domestic as a system? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. But I, it makes me really nervous that when I see a woman who's in such a position, whether she thinks it's a, her free choice or whether she's forced to do it against her will, I don't know the difference, makes me feel really bad about myself that I can't help her, that it's happening on my watch, that her head is on a pike, so to speak, from my point of view, and I'm doing nothing. It makes me feel really nervous. Just to clarify, you said there's no Islamophobia, or is there, is there discrimination against Muslims in the United States? Are you Islamoph Islamophobia is a notion? Islamophobia is the false concept that just as there's hatred or persecution or discrimination against Jews, 
or against African Americans, or against Native Indians, or against anybody who's foreign or different or looks different, the Asian Americans, that there is a similar and equal discrimination against Muslims. That's not true. That's simply not true, and it's become the coin of the realm at the United Nations and the coin of the realm at international conferences. Uh, yes, it's true. 9-11, uh, everybody was Arab, everybody was Muslim. Let me think. Let me think. Does this mean everybody is? No, Americans are sort of good-hearted. No, not everybody. You know, just the bad guys, the bad guys, right? And then there's more and more and more, and everybody's Muslim. And by the way, we're the last to get it. The Muslim on Muslim violence is much greater. Much, much greater. I mean, they're blowing each other up while they're in prayer. Sunnis are blowing up Shia. Shia blowing up Sunnis. Everybody's blowing up the Sufis. I mean, they're, they're doing it to each other first. We're later on. We're later on. We're getting less of it, actually. So uh, this is the way of life. And now at a very, very bad moment. So what I'm saying is that Americans are not Islamophobic. Americans may now have some questions about who the Muslims really are and what their intentions are and whether or not they're part of jihad. But that's not the same as a belief firmly rooted that like the Jews own the banks, own the media, want to control the world, elders of Zion. We don't have a mythology about Muslims in the same way. I don't mean to sound angry. I don't know. Any other questions? Or comments? Any answers? <laughs> answers? I have questions. Okay. Um, I have such a question. Do you allow such possibility that a woman really wants to be veiled, and th that this is really her own choice and her decision. And what to do with such women when you ban uh, Borka awesome. and Raymond? Well, I'm wondering question, myself. She's yeah. asking whether I would contemplate even, could I imagine that a woman might truly, freely, of her own free will, with no consequence, to please no one, to ingratiate himself with no one, would she then want to be fully face veiled or face and body veiled? Well, you know, I, I did a study that led to a book called Women, Money, and Power that came out in 1976. And the study, I would ask women, well, do you think you're being economically discriminated against? The answers were mainly no. I don't feel discriminated against. I'm I'm really happy with the job I have. I'm happy I have a job that lets me also be a wife and mother. I'm happy I have a job at all. Which is not the same as does she have a free choice as as opposed to a forced choice. A free choice is you say to a woman, you could, if you wish, be the president of General Motors the president of the world, you know, certainly a senator from your state, you could be a physician, you could be a veterinarian, you could be a scholar, you could be a poet, or you could be a prostitute. What's your choice? What's your free view? Because the forced choice is not the same as a free choice. You need to have options mm -hmm. to make the choice free. You need to have options, if you exercise them, that you don't get killed. Mm -hmm. Now, I could appreciate, really, wanting to remind oneself that one lives under God's grace and that one is here by grace of God in case oneself forgets. I could appreciate uh, doing this in a way that's known only to me. Otherwise, I'm really showing it off, aren't I? <laughs> hey, see me, I'm one of God's people. But all right, let's say that there are some outward signs to say, please, understand that when you come to me that you're also approaching the Selim. I'm in God's image, that we have a value system here of a certain kind. I could appreciate something, yes, but a full face and body covering, no, because that, especially when her husband and her father and her brother 
are wearing modern Western dress. If it's very hot, they're wearing very cool and comfortable clothing. She's sweating in sweltering heat, carrying bundles and a baby, and can't see. I, no, that's not a free choice. I don't think that a free choice is being made available. And I also think that young girls in families are certainly, if they're loved, they're going to want to please the people who are loving them and taking care of them, and they'll be influenced. And so I could see wanting to wear hijab to identify with your culture, with your religion, with your God, but not, not the burqa. No. No. So anybody else? Professor with Chet? an answer. Professor yeah. I, I was a consultant in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia in 1985, and Yes, the women in the street did wear a burqa, but when I was entertained at dinners in the home of deans and the professor and even the president of the university, all the women were in Parisian clothes. <laughs> so they had a purpose there, I think, in hiding themselves until they could show you their beautiful clothes and beautiful women. I don't, I don't know. What was the purpose? I, you're saying that the, he's saying that he was a consultant in 1985 in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where indeed the women were wearing the full 24 yards and sweltering, and not, I'm, they were not able to go out without a male chaperone, That's true. and they couldn't drive their own car. They sat in front of the bus. They, and they had segregated and all things. All right, so. And remember the girls who died recently, three, four years ago, they were escaping, they were high school girls, escaping a blazing fire of their schoolhouse, and the religious police beat them back in because they hadn't veiled themselves properly enough to exit. Fourteen died. The government ended up pay paying blood debt. So if what you're saying, are you saying that these were Saudi wives of Saudi men? Yes. And you were an infidel in That's their right. home. Okay. That's right. Many then they must in their home. Okay. Then you were being, uh, the hospitality given you was very special and must have had a purpose. Because everybody knows that under, the minute the plane leaves Saudi s soil, the women flip it right off. We know what they're wearing underneath it. We know that they hate to wear it, but wear it they must. Now, I'm interested, though, in, in whether everyone you know who was there at the time in some consulting capacity had similar access, because that's not typical. No, I was privileged, I guess. But, but, no, but why? <laughs> Think why, because there must have been an interesting reason. Well, I was helping them establish a new college, and uh, they wanted my services, even though they knew I was Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, but did you? Did you pray in any synagogues in Saudi Arabia? There is no synagogue. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Maybe a church? Because that's there another no thing. There is no church. No, no, that's another thing that really bothers me. Because there's a call here, mosque, more it's mosque, so bigger mosque. Here, but no reciprocity. So that's what I mean by Islamic religious apartheid. Because only one religion is allowed in a Muslim country. You have to hide your Christianity. You, Jew, Jews, you don't lie out completely, and you, you cannot worship. Can you and um, so did you help them set up a good college with three programs? Still in existence. Not called King Saud University. So, <laughs> so you were entertained by members of the royal family? Yes. Well, that makes the exception. I even went to the racetrack and watched the yeah. royal races. Yeah, no, this, is, this, <laughs> then, this is an exception. This is not the rule. Okay, so one last question, Professor yeah, Benetra. Uh, it's uh, just a very brief, I go back to what Alexandra asked earlier about this not being the first choice, or the, being the choice to wear the book. Would you say the same thing for the Haredi community, men in Jerusalem or Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. Would it be free choice or it's uh, mm -hmm. false? Ah, it's, well, you know, I would say it's probably a forced choice, but they can see, their senses are exposed. I mean, maybe they're blind even though they can see, but you, know, you, can, you can ears, eyes, smell, mouth, you can have a conversation with them, they can see with the pavement, the steps, so it's not the same. Now, whether, that's a good question. 
uh, that's a very an important thing because very few people have free choice when it comes to religion in childhood. Everyone is forced into it or tempted, gentled into it, and then as an adult, maybe has a choice, maybe doesn't. Maybe exercises the choice, maybe doesn't because you don't want to hurt all the people who brought you up and you've come to grow, uh, you've grown accustomed to these customs. To these customs. I don't like that, I do not like the increased uglification of the Haredi women. I do not like the heavy uh, stockings, the long dresses, heavy in the summer, and always so dark and forbissena and forbidding. <laughs> and, and then with the wig and on top of uh, some, uh, something over the wig. This is crazy. <coughs> this, but she still has her five senses. She still can see where she's walking. She can talk. You can hear her. You can identify her at an airport. It's not the same. So I wanted to say Professor Menashri is the founder of the study of Iranian, the Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University is here for the semester once a week or so visiting us. So if people have questions about Iranian society, he's the man. <laughs> Any other quick questions? We have a couple more minutes. Okay, one, one last oh, question. Oh, let me about, say something. Yeah. All right, no, guys. Okay. Sorry, yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, quick question. You had talked about the fact that perhaps um, using media, it's only the moderate or the more intelligent or the average Muslim in the Arab countries have the freedom and, and could understand Western Western world. But by the same token, you're also saying that the Arabs or the Muslims living in Western Europe are much more severely the women. I mean, the honor the honor killings there are much more severe. The torture is much more severe because they're exposed to all these ideas. Somehow, I mean, the idea that if we just kind of beam our ideas into Jordan and Saudi Arabia, there'll be a mass uprising. No, 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 I'm not a mass uprising. uprising. I, I'm exaggerating. Mm -hmm. But compared to that, I mean, they have these things available in Western Europe, mm -hmm. and yet it hasn't stopped the honor killings. Well, mm -hmm. you're perfectly right. But mm -hmm. because they're available more and more, first there are moderate and dissident and ex-Muslims in Europe, too, who are fully enjoying the freedom. Some of them are women, and one, Samia Labidi, is in Paris in her article in Zain O'Baron's book, I highly recommend, very important article. Um, there, there are many Muslim women experiencing lots of freedom in Europe, and they're not being honor murdered. And they've broken, uh, many have broken with their communities, fled them, and others, not so. Uh, I was privileged to, um, Seyran Atesh is a Turkish-born Berlin lawyer who uh, has written a number of books criticizing Islam and whose fondest dream was to create a mosque in Berlin where men and women could pray together equally as equals. But she's put that on hold. Representing immigrant women, she was shot nearly to death by the man who murdered the woman she was counseling, a battered teenager. And she came back and she continued her work and her latest book is called Islam Needs a Sexual Revolution. So she calls me up from Berlin one day and says, can I come and stay with you for a week? And I said, yes. I said, any particular reason why you have business here? And she says, no, the police think it's better if I leave town for, <laughs> for a week and it's in Berlin. So she's now keeping a low profile and taking care of family matters. But I think that uh, this exchange of ideas is a fertile exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like, as I said, I would like to know what they're writing in Arabic and Persian and Kurdish. I really want to know what they're saying, and I want them to know what I'm saying. And there's so far no uh, funding for a very simple translation project and a, and a mm -hmm. very easy to do technology project. Well, not as easy, but possible. So uh, I think that the Anna, the Anna killings are emanating from certain countries and from men at a certain level, even though there are exceptions. There are very uh, educated and wealthy 
families that engage in this collaboration in murder, that it is also largely a function of the low-skilled, unemployed, uh, there's a case that I was testifying in, an, an honor killing, uh, a potential honor killing victim who got out, and I, I can't say the country from Europe, and it's a precedent case here in America, because the asylum would be from a European country that is failing perhaps to protect certain people. And uh, the argument has great merit because there are certain, if you marry your first cousin, no, if you come and then you bring your relatives, all of whom are kept sequestered for women and not allowed out to learn a European language or to go to a European school, and um, you then have a daughter who's born on European soil, but you wanted to be like her mother, and you wanted to marry the first cousin. That, and so it's men who are living on the dole uh, that Europe is handing out, that's another whole discussion, who are then doing what you do in the old country. A woman is uppity, she's even slightly unpleasant, <coughs> or she really violates a taboo for real, you kill her, you kill her. That's the custom, it's not necessarily religious law, it's just that too few mullahs have stood against it and said, I will not allow such a family into my mosque. That this is a crime reaching out to Allah. I won't permit it. Right. We need more of that. Yeah, and so thank you. And on that note, you know, in terms of the study of anti-Semitism, Deborah Lipstadt at Emory University, Professor Lipstadt, has a, a web-based project where she's translating uh, text dealing you know, with the Holocaust into Persian and Arabic. Okay. So it may be a model to be used uh, for issues of gender. Anyway, so on behalf of ESA, we have to leave the building. I'm sorry. <laughs>